show of hands, how many people have heard? <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, have you, do you have birds now? Well, do you want to read all the slides as I go through them because that will help explain things in greater detail. I highlighted the important points. Bucky Fuller was right. Earth is like a spaceship. A tiny little spaceship with all of us on board. And this image really puts things in perspective for us. <laughs> Don't you think? I was listening to an interview with Katie Payne on the radio last week. She's the biologist who discovered that humpback whales compose ever-changing songs and that elephants communicate across long distances by infrasound. Those are little vibrations that we can't hear. It's language they create with their voices and hear to their feet. It was a fascinating interview talking about all the complex problems people run into living with animals and the tough decisions we face in managing them. Here she sums up her experience. We are not at the pinnacle of human knowledge. We are only beginning. Animals experience their worlds in ways we cannot understand, with senses we've long lost or we never had. They define their worlds with exquisite senses of smell and hearing, with vision that sees what we can't imagine, or with responses to chemical or electromagnetic properties that we are insensitive to. By these yardsticks, many animals are far smarter than we are. And so we find that we're just beginning to understand how they fit. Bucky Fuller shows us how one person can change the world, and he did it by changing himself. It's more important than ever that we pay attention to what we're dreaming into the world. Sometimes we lose sight of what's important to us, but we can stay on track by solving the problems of the other beings we care about. And we have some big problems to face. Yale Environment 360 published a story on the way perceptions shift, exploring how species piece the matter as the natural world vanishes. Humans lose sight of disappearing species with every generation, accepting a diminished environment as the new norm. Scientists call this phenomenon intergenerational amnesia. You can see for yourself the popularity of the yellow-headed parrot has been its downfall. The minute we take parrots out of their niche in the wild, we've created a new creature that can't be inserted back into the natural world because they don't understand correct social protocol for being accepted back into the flock, they can't speak the flock dialect, they don't know where to find food, and the flock will run out of their territory because they're outsiders. Parrots are running each other for printing any feathers they can't reach themselves, building nests, finding food, standing guard while other members are eating. People who set their pet store bird, birds free are not doing them any favors. Here at home, I remember a few years ago when I read that PetSmart was no longer selling birds. At the time, I thought, well, parrots, big parrots. At the time, I thought it was a good thing because the general public doesn't understand what it takes to keep such a long-lived companion healthy, well-fed, and socially integrated in its new human family. Then the truth dawned on me. Without a relationship with wild parrots, humans are not going to notice that species after species slides into oblivion. What seems like a good solution for parrots is actually a paradox, because they cannot fend for themselves when meeting them. Out of sight really is out of mind. A bird's eye view of survival tells us something important about ourselves. What can we, what can we be taking into consideration to make life better for everyone? A look at conventional farming techniques proves not much thought was given early on to cumulative dangers of these poisons as they were continuously being fed into the earth. Biotechnology's promise to feed the world did not anticipate Trojan corn, super weeds, and the dis disappearance of monarch butterflies. Last week, President Obama signed the Monsanto Protection Act. It's a law that effectively bars 
federal courts from being able to halt the sale, the planting of controversial genetically modified or genetically engineered seeds, no matter what health issues may arise concerning GMOs in the future. In light of all this, is there something we can do to change human lives? I'd like to think so. Living in paradise like I do, I'd like to work towards giving the seventh generation a chance to see what I have. Human beings really are transformers. We take problems into our hearts and we solve them by caring, by being mindful, by having compassion, and by acting with loving kindness. If we have the courage to see, really see, in the deepest way we can, we can make connections and find new solutions. I'll show you a few ways that's worked in my life. First, I want to tell you how birds taught me, taught me how to think, taught me how to become a trend tab. My people are considered themselves a trim tab, and that's a miniature rudder, that little part of the rudder that moves the rudder itself, and then it moves the whole ship. I've seen how that works. I've logged more than 30,000 hours working with parrots in the last 20 years. Well, a decade ago, I got the thrill of my life. I wrote, designed, and published a book for an avian veterinarian who sells organic bird food worldwide. He gave away 20,000 copies, and it rocked the pet food industry. I saw the rippling perceptual shift as it moved through the mass media, changing the way people talked about feeding their pets. And not just birds, dogs and cats benefited too. And before long, those concepts were showing up in the ways people took care of themselves too. Apparently, a critical mass had been reached. It was like riding the crest of a wave that had been building, 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 and then when it crashed, everything changed. I got to see this change because Dr. Greg Harrison is obviously a much bigger trim tab, directing a much bigger show. He is only one of seven other veterinarians in the world who are double board specialists. He contributes to and publishes his own avian medical textbooks, and he grows certified organic pet fur food world or pet fur food and wild bird food and sells it worldwide. He understands the connection between nutrition and disease. And he says that malnutrition underlies 90% of all clinical cases. You might want to pay special attention to this slide for your own benefit. Birds in wild places have access to seeds in the spring and fall. Birds in cages eat them all year long. There are a lot of critically important nutrients missing, missing, especially when birds pick out only a few of their favorite seeds day after day. Here's how far we've come in understanding bird nutrition. Take a look at how many different animal foods they're trying, introducing all kinds of probiotics from unrelated creatures, getting all kinds of contaminants from various manufacturing processes. You'll notice people <coughs> tried a little bit of everything. The reason they kept looking is because they weren't getting good results. The truth is, the only species-specific research ever been done on bird nutrition were small studies including cockatiels and African greys. I have carrots from four continents. The food I offer them is nothing like what they would eat in the wild. How can anyone follow a parrot to the jungle and see what it's eating, you might wonder. Well, in 1995, National Geographic did a spread on my cause showing the, the birds, how they fly through the jungle, and no one had ever done that before. It was really exciting to me. I bought like three copies, and I made paintings of it in stained glass windows, and <laughs> really got turned on. And then I found out that Dr. Harrison was working with these people too in TRC. They were climbing into macaw nests and taking the babies out, weighing them, and examining the contents of their crops to find out what they were being fed. In eight years of study, TRC found that nature is at best a cyclic and sometimes ruthless caregiver. Most food items were available only seasonally. Without intervention, most babies starved on a jungle diet. Malnutrition was not uncommon for those who did manage to make it, and only 20% survived without help. Researchers fed chicks on a diet based on the same foods they would find in the forest. 
And as they grew, the birds who had been adopted were not getting the proper nutrients and came back for handouts constantly. They were too weak to join their counterparts in the wild. Dr. Harrison donated time and food, and after eating his food, the babies came back stronger and were able to join the wild flock. Three years later, they mated with wild birds and established their own nests close to the compound where they'd been raised, thus accomplishing the goal of increasing reproduction rates in wild populations with the captive raising and release program. Based on these studies, Dr. Charles Mum of the Wildlife Conservation Society of the Bronx Zoo also chose Dr. Harrison's bird food for his blue-throated macaw and hyacinth macaw recovery projects that same year, hoping to use the same techniques with more endangered species in artificial nest boxes. In an interview, Dr. Mun made this statement about the birds they worked with. The growth was spectacular. The feathers looked perfect. In fact, their color was brighter, probably because Harrison's bird food has more perfect nutrition and wind feeding than their parents could get in a week. And Dr. Harrison also gets responses like this from people in agriculture. You see how their business improved in just five years. Here's what I feed my birds. On the weekends, I give them a special treat. I post pictures of them on Facebook to remind my friends to think about their own nutrition. You can go to Dr. Harrison's website to learn more. Carrots have about 350 taste buds, so they like strong flavors. Humans have 9,000. Chlorophyll really makes their colors vibrant. I'm just going to go through these really quick. In the final analysis, food is medicine. Now I'd like to tell a story about my African Grey and how his mind works. I call him Muji. It means the cream unknown. One time I put my hand into his cage, it startled him. And suddenly I found my skin, or in the, arm, my, the skin of my arm in his mouth. And he's squeezing pretty hard because he was falling and was trying to catch his balance. And that got him to thinking. Oh no. <laughs> Did I forget? That guy was thinking, he deserved a little something for making him look cool. He gave it a little thought and volunteered to play the heavy. And as it was all hardened, the pressure increased. He was committing himself to the action. I could, of course, move my arm. Brains with no neocortex at all. 
first contemporary complex cognitive tests <coughs> most thought to be unique to primates and to humans. These tests include seeing optical illusions, forming concepts, understanding the mental state of another individual, using the manufacturing tools, and communicating specific meanings to achieve specific goals. These discoveries challenge our notion of the evolution of the brain and show us that there's more than one way of acquiring an intelligent brain. I first learned of mirror neurons from an internationally famous psychologist, Daniel Goleman, after he worked with the Dalai Lama on the Mind and Life Conference series. Mirror neurons are a kind of neural Wi-Fi that monitors what's happening in other people. The system tracks their emotional responses, body movements, and the intentions, and then it activates precisely the same brain areas in our brains, Goldman explained. This puts us on the same wavelength, and it does so automatically, instantaneously, and unconsciously. Such neurons have been observed in primates and other species, including birds. Mirror neurons make emotions contagious, letting the feelings we witness flow through us, helping us get in sync and follow what's going on. We feel the other in the broadest sense of the word, sensing their sentiment, their movements, their sensations, their emotions as they act inside us. So what might this lead to? In the 1990s, the PBS series called Life Birds with David Attenborough introduced us to some crows in Japan. We dropped nuts on the intersection so that cars could crack them. And after they ran over them, the birds would pick them up and eat them. Before long, crows started performing this behavior in California, too. The behavior had never been seen before, and now it looked as if crows halfway around the world were learning the same trick at about the same time. So how does this work? Well, isn't that the hunter's monkey effect? That's a phenomenon that shows when enough of us are aware of something, all of us become aware of it. Is this proof of Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance and morphogenic fields? Is it related to Young's concept of collective consciousness and the concept of Akashic records from the Vedas representing the library of thought forms? Time will tell. Science will catch up as we keep pushing the boundaries of understanding. For the three times I woke up mysteriously and went to my aviary to find a snake hunting for eggs before anyone made a peep, I'm just glad it works. Parents are terrified of a belt laying on the floor when they don't when they've never even seen a snake before. So I knew I was very lucky to just happen to be in the right place at the right time, three times in the middle of the night for no particular reason. Come to think of birds as ambassadors to universal intelligence. I spend a couple hours a day in my aviary, more when it's time to wash everything down. These are birds like the ones I have, and these are the lifespan. These parrots are from Africa, South America, and India. The cockatoo is from Australia, macaws from South America, and of course, the napkin gray is the cerebral show. Let's have some fun. Meeting mm -hmm. Evie and Eric. And here are some websites in case you'd like to find out more. Evie's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. six. <laughs> She's just a baby. And she She's seven now. Oh, seven? And she knows hundreds of words. Just doesn't want to say them right now. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little nervous. And a little cool, and this is sort of a, a low time of day for birds. They're usually most active in the mornings and in the afternoons, feeding times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just hold her foot up, wanting to step up. <laughs> Maybe a little music. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's wanting to step up. She's going to say it. So. Yeah, she's a little nervous. Yeah. 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 Y
then she went off. <laughs> <laughs> they are like a little kid. They sometimes don't even know what they want. They <laughs> know they want oh, something. tell the story about you going to the refrigerator. Oh yeah, sometimes uh, she, she seems to have a knack for guessing. Like when you look at something, she'll like say like you know you go to the refrigerator, pull something out, and she'll say it right as you're grabbing it, and it's kind of gives you one of those eerie moments. Because uh, it's in the other room, she can't. Yeah, see it. she can't see it, but she just names it out while you're looking at it for some reason. <laughs> but uh, an interesting uh, thing she did with a, uh, a radish uh, star. We I was on a Friday afternoon. And I was trying to get her to identify a, a red plastic star, a red star. And I did it with her several times. Uh, and that was the first time she'd been introduced to a red star. And the next morning, Kelly, my sister-in-law, was preparing her breakfast and cut a radish circle into a star shape. And when Bibi went to look and look down at her breakfast, first thing she says, radish star. So she's able to like, understand the concepts of a shape and apply it to something she's never seen before. Um, where, so a lot of people, they believe that uh, parrots are simple mimics and that they don't have any understanding of the words that they say. But BB, she understands, so uh, she can identify a lot of objects and she will sp ask for specific foods when she wants it. And she tells us when she's ready to go to bed. She'll say, you know, I'm a sleepy bird, <laughs> you know, uh, ready to go to bed. And, Stuff like that. So that so there's a, a definite intelligence there that uh, a lot of people don't uh, don't and understand. I had never I never used pronouns talking to this bird. That I have an African gray, and one day it started calling me. It calls me Birdie because I call it Birdie. It says, "Hey Birdie, come here. I know bite you. Come <laughs> here. I know bite you." And I was like, "Wait a minute. Pronouns. Wait a minute." <laughs> How did and you learn that? How how could you know and put that together? Because I would I'd say no bite, no no bite. Whenever I pick it up and you do something, whenever they bite, the first thing I do is I pick them up because the moment they make that decision to step on your hand, you've won. You're in charge. And so it's always like this, no biting. And then it uses my voice and says, no biting. Exactly <laughs> the same time I'm saying it. I'm like, yes, so why are you biting? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they do have a, uh, they figure out uh, the elements of our grammar uh, when we use it. So she uses verbs and, and adjectives and, and nouns properly. And, and pronouns, the syntax. And yeah, and so she doesn't, you know, she usually gets things in the correct word order so she can create new sentences uh, using words that, you know, putting them in, in her own, uh, putting them in her own words. Um, and and it's, all, it's almost like a kid that way, obviously. She's not going to conjugate everything correctly or everything. She just, she, she uses it as a, as a way to communicate. She, you know, since we don't speak uh, African Grey Parrot, she's had to figure out our language. Uh, um, in, the, in the wild, they speak, you know, each African Grey flock will have its own dialect. And when the, a member goes from one flock to live in another flock, they have to adopt that other flock's dialect. So she's just adopted our speech. Um, yeah, because you can't be in the club if you don't know the handshake. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 right? and, and, and it, her, uh, her ability, uh, usually most African greys, they say they typically have a linguistic ability of about a two-year-old child. Um, and, but they have an intelligence of anywhere, you said her 13, but mm -hmm. some say you know, 5 to 13, depending on who you talk to, is their, their intelligence level. So the, a lot of times they're very frustrated. Yeah, but um, they have to know, like, What's blooming in the forest when? Who to avoid once you get there? I mean, there's a lot you have to know to be a good bird. Yeah. And, and they can probably communicate with each other in their flocks in the wild a lot better than humans can with them. So a lot, African greys are known for being kind of neurotic. They're, they're you know, and they, they have a lot of issues and a lot of them pluck. And then boredom's a huge issue. You, know, you read books where they'll say that, oh, you have to give them at least 45 minutes of interaction a day outside of their cage or just at least interact with them or else they'll go crazy. But they need much more than that. They, they basically need hours a day of interaction to keep them emotionally uh, healthy. And, and boredom becomes a big problem with the more intelligent birds. They, you know, they, so they start plucking each other. They have all kinds of neurotic behavior. Um, but Bibi, because she knows so many words and she's able to communicate with us what she wants when she wants it, it 
creates a lot less frustration for her than it would for, for most birds. There's a, um, she, it's very uh, unusual that, she's, that, that we don't understand what she wants. Um, and because she'll just tell us. She'll you know, say, I want pizza. Well, you know, she wants pizza. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I want a berry. That's like one of her favorite snacks. And, and she'll just tell us what she wants. So, uh, On your website, you let people donate berries? Yeah, yeah, because she has a uh, thing with, uh, they call them Nutri-berries, and they're basically made out of pellets and, and seed, and they're nutritionally for, uh, fortified so that they're, they're healthy and not deficient. And that's one of her favorite snacks, and she asks for them all the time. She likes those, and she really likes almonds, um, which almonds are, are very good food for, you know, even though they do have a lot of fat, you have to watch, uh, um, and that's another problem with uh, seed diets is that they wind up having way too much fat. And, I, it, you know, in the wild they'll live to be, you know, 50, 70 years old or more, but in the wild, it, you know, in, in uh, captivity until recently, they didn't usually live anywhere near that nearly that long just because of the poor nutrition. Um, people didn't know, you know, and, and a lot of people, they would just fill up their bird dish with, you know, sunflower seeds every mean, day, you know, you and know, it's, oh, you know, peanuts, yeah, and, and we, we had a, we had a rescue parrot that stayed with Bibi for a while, and uh, he fed mostly a diet of peanuts when he was when he was younger, and he had uh, coronary artery disease and, and died young. So, so it's like you know, like with humans, and they don't metabolize fat the same way. It's why you don't in the wild you don't see obese birds. You know, they, they, this doesn't happen. And, and if uh, they have too much fat, they're you know, it's like the foie gras. The the the, the liver becomes diseased and fatty and, and they're just unable to deal with it. There's a lot of uh, substances, they don't metabolize alcohol, which obviously you're not, you shouldn't be giving a pair of alcohol, but they don't metabolize that in a lot of things. And uh, they can't tolerate chocolate or avocados. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even questions about onions. Uh, oh yeah, onions. And, uh, yeah, and, green, and green beans if they're not it. cooked. Um, I, you know, you they're even supposed onions. to be toxic for people, even the mm -hmm. people eat them. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, Green beans. Green beans. Yeah, yeah. They put them out on salad bars all the time, but they they are slightly toxic. Um, and so, if it's something like for humans, you know, it's like, oh well, you know, I can eat it; it's not a problem. But you know, the, you know, so I use canaries in the, the mines, you know, because they're so much more susceptible to anything like that. So you have to be so much more careful about air quality, what kind of water you're giving them. You know, it's they're very uh, uh, much more fragile than humans. You know, and I always think, you know, even when I'm driving with her, you know, I have to be really careful. I'm a careful driver anyway, but, you, you know, you can't do sudden stops. And if, you know, a, a minor situation that wouldn't result in an injury of a person could, could easily kill a bird. Um, they, they are very fragile. It's amazing they live as long as they do. <laughs> Their bones are hollow. Yeah. Yeah, traumas are really bad for them. And they, and they go into shock very easily. And another issue you face with, with birds is that uh, most vets just don't have any idea how to, to deal with them. Yeah, all they have to do is hang a shingle. They can say yeah. that they do, but then you find out they don't because yeah. it usually like shows up right away. And Bibi, uh, she has a, uh, a seizure disorder, and uh, she's met with specialists, uh, you know, at the University of Illinois and all over, and, and they seem to be uh, under much better control, but. Uh, that's a, a problem that some African greys have. It's uh, um, epileptic. Yeah, and, and so you know, it was it was really frustrating when you go around trying to find a, an avian vet, and there's there's just none available hardly in this area. And we see, found all, we found ones that would that see, would help, and they they have to become out. you know kind of experts in mm -hmm. it because you know you, even the avian vets don't usually know about like seizures in African greys or any specific. And it's a very specific thing and. Like for an emergency situation, you know, you can't just take a parrot to a regular vet. They just don't. They won't. They won't know anything about how to treat it. I, I actually had a, a vet, and they called. They uh, when birds when their feathers start going in, there's a blood supply to them, and if they break during that time, they call it blo a blood feather. And if they break during that time, it acts like a quill, and it can they can bleed to death if the. The, the quills pull not pulled out. out, or if, uh, you know, and in the wild they usually chew it and it's fine. That's or why you don't want your birds flapping around inside their cage because mm. there's a snake on the ground. Yeah, and uh, I called a vet, and she actually, you know, a vet actually recommended to cut the, the blood feather 
um, out, which was, was terrible advice, and I knew better than to do that. But um, <laughs> really, yeah, so, that, so that's what is, happens, you know. All you have to do is take a pair of pliers and grab it up high. I mean, you don't even have to pull. I mean, the bird will just pull away from that, and so it's not like you're causing a lot of trauma. It's just yeah. a feather, but if you don't do it, it'll lead to that. Yeah. Yeah, and in the wild, they don't run into that problem so much because they they will chew on them. You know, and if the feathers are a problem, they'll chew it, and then they usually do a good, pretty good job pinching off. I'm sure they lose some that way, but um, a clean cut. That's why when you know when if people clip their uh, bird's wings, they have to be careful not to, to clip a blood feather because then you have to pull it out, or the bird will bleed to death. Um, and they don't have a whole lot of blood. You know, <laughs> they're the little bitty birds. So she could fly if she wanted to. Um, her, her feathers are growing in, so she could make she could maybe fly halfway to you. She wouldn't have lips. <laughs> she, you know. she could soar. Um, she she used to be clipped, um, and we're letting them grow in. So we, we basically want her to be able to fly gently to the ground, but not fly off because she she has a, a daily broadcast that she does uh, on UStream, and uh, you know people from all over the, the country watch her, and so. <laughs> We have to kind of keep her in one place, you know, you know but um, she, she's a therapy bird. A lot of uh, elderly and you know, disabled people uh, watch her every day for, for enjoyment. And uh, the uh, community's kind of built up around uh, BB. And then the BB's road trip, like Cheryl sure, wearing, she uh, traveled around, you know, uh, to 12 different cities to, be, to visit her uh, fans. And there's going to be uh, two more legs of the BB's road trip as uh, uh, part of a documentary uh, from a Kickstarter project. People donate tens of thousands of dollars to see this bird. Yeah, so, they, so she'll uh, this know, is have a, special a documentary, bird. documentary about her because uh, um, it had an issue. One of her fans was uh, terminally ill and uh, lived in St. Louis and made a request. You know, asked, said she wanted to see Bibi before mm -hmm. she died. And so, you know, luckily because she was so close that uh, that was able to happen. And so then all our other fans are like, well, I want to see BB too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and, and uh, she has a, uh, seems to have a particular, uh, a ta uh, what do you call it, a, 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 a connection with autistics. It, you know, um, there's been a, a few of her fans uh, or parents will contact us and say that they're autistic child. Uh, really enjoys watching BB. Had uh, one parent contact us and said that her child started watching BB, and there was a, a change, a complete change in her way that she interacted with other people, and and seemed to you know suddenly develop much more empathy for people and have connections with people that she didn't previously have, and uh, wound up actually buying her a uh, uh, her parents wound up buying her a cocktail, and she took care of the cocktail and. You know, it was, uh, they said it really uh, helped improve her uh, quality of life. Cockatiels are about robin-sized birds. And they have this little top knot that comes up, like a cockatoo. <laughs> Cockatoos are like the ones that Beretta had. <laughs> and they're both Australian birds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in Australia, they're kind of considered a nuisance. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and in mm -hmm. Africa, these they're considered a nuisance. Uh, there's, you know, you'll have villages where you know people maybe don't even have enough to eat and you'll have a flock of African gray parrots come in and they can lay waste to a, to a field. And probably what's, you know, frustrating, particularly frustrating is that they only eat a very small percentage of what they destroy. You know, the, they'll, you know, the, they one of the reasons for their high intelligence is to believe that they have a cooperative feeding behaviors in the wild. And uh, some will go up into the trees you know, and all they will do is basically take a bite and then drop whatever is left on the ground. And so they'll yeah, drop like 90% of what they eat, they drop, and then there will be, the rest of the flock will feed on the ground from what gets dropped to them, and they take turns doing these different jobs. And then there will be other birds that will specifically keep a lookout for predators. So, so they, and they communicate with each other in the flock, they uh, have individual names, um, so they can refer to each other uh, specifically um, and, and there's very little known about we know that they have different dialects we know that they use names uh, to communicate with each other but we don't we're, we're unable to understand what they say in the wild you know it's but yet they can they can understand what we're saying it's easy it seems easier for them to learn our language than the other way although you you 
tend to go more towards uh, communicating on the birds level rather than you know teaching them English to communicate with you because you have all these different birds and you're able to, to understand them on a more bird level. <laughs> you know, it's, mm -hmm. um, for us, uh, we're, you know, BB uh, is kind of, there's a, you might have heard of the uh, African great parent named Alex. He's a, a famous uh, test subject in uh, different cognitive studies. So we're kind of using her as a little bit of a, of a test uh, of what's possible uh, cognitively and linguistically for, for a, a bird. But one thing we avoid is turning her into a lab experiment in the sense that, you know, we don't want a situation where we have, you know, for eight hours a day, the bird's taken out of the cage into a, yeah. you know, into a, yeah, a, like a laboratory environment and then, you know, drilled and then put back into a sterile environment because to, to yeah. really do it scientifically, they, there almost has to be sensory deprivation yeah. when the bird isn't being tested. So you want to make sure that it doesn't get any outside influence. Whereas where, you know, with Phoebe, it's more like, you know, teaching a kid. You know, you're, you're using, trying to encourage her to do what she what she does. So she does do tricks. You know, she'll do uh, um, she like waves and dances and turns around. But she doesn't always do them. And she, you know, and like right now she'd be too nervous probably to do them. Will you wait? Will you be wait? I don't have a tree. So I'm sorry. But <laughs> but, um, but Kelly, um, Kelly, she does tricks for Kelly uh, more readily. Oh. Yeah. No, while you were talking about language, I was just going to ask if they have a, like a critical phase for learning our language. They probably do. Just like, you know, if you, there's uh, the younger, the better. Yeah. Um, and she started young. You yeah. know, um, but, you know, some will learn later, but there, there probably is. Well, it's like my bird. Time. Every once in a while, he will say something that is right on, and he will say it once, and he will never say it again. Like one time, <laughs> when he was new, I tried to pet him and he kind of bit at me so I'm like, I have to take this. Oh, actually, I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to support that behavior. I'm not going to give him any attention. So I just went back to sweeping and he said, now you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you're in trouble. So then he got my attention that way because that was funny. <laughs> How did BB get started in all of it? Um, just uh, once, we, as soon as we got her, we started, uh, uh, talking, she kind of said step up. Was that step up that she kind of came saying a little bit? Like, yeah. You know, and, and uh, just start working and she you know, learned hello and uh, jumbo, which is uh, uh, hello in Swahili. One of her first ones was hungry because yeah, she had a microwave yeah. heat. And we'd <laughs> ask her, we'd be uh, cooking up the water to make her little porridge because when she was hand fed when she was a baby, she'd hear the microwave beep. And then the next thing would be us coming over to her with a spoon or a syringe saying, are you hungry? And mm -hmm. ready to feed her. So whenever she, she made that association of microwave and being hungry. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, for a lot of people when they have a uh, bird, you know, that talks, you know, parrot, uh, you know, about 12 words or maybe a couple dozen words is fairly common. You know, it's, it's kind of unusual to have have a bird that, that knows hundreds of words, and, and probably part of it is that she did start young. Um, and that you work with her every day. Every yeah. day, every day. And, and, yeah, and you know, we things. work at home, you know, work from home, and she's there, we're there with her, so. Um, That's kind of why I speak bird, because I don't have time <laughs> to teach them human, because there's plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my god. Yeah. And, and okay, you know, they are very kid-like in the sense that she knows her colors. But, you know, to get her to even, you know, touch one color over the other, sometimes she'll, she'll you know, has a contrarian attitude, you know, and <laughs> just won't do it or, you know, it's, and she won't, sometimes won't talk, and just <laughs> like now. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes she won't even step up. She's nervous. But... She's been getting better. She, you know, she's only seven years old. It, uh, years ago, uh, it was like she probably when she was one, one years, one year old, maybe close to two. Um, we put a video up of her saying hello in eight different languages, and the Ellen DeGeneres show called and, and invited BB to come out and be on the show. But you can see from from here what you know. You take take a bird on a television show, and she's not going. I can say anything. <laughs> and I had to tell him that it's like she's too young. She's you know there's a there is a parrot named Einstein at the Knoxville Zoo that does a daily show um, and does a lot of different uh, 
I think it's on like uh, some of these television programs, like uh, Amazing Animals or something like that. And he does a lot of different sound effects and, and says a few words and, and does it all on command. And they're able to perform a regular show, which I find kind of amazing. I, you know, I'd be like trying to, you know, you know, train a little two-year-old kid to do a show like three times a day. I mean, <laughs> you're lucky if you can make that happen. <laughs> but yeah, their uh, their emotional development lags behind their intelligence, so they're kind of like a, a a brilliant kid, and they're terrible twos. You know, they're like, you know, and they just they don't get it. They just they're selfish. They don't, you know, your your needs aren't really important to them at all. It's it's all about them. I beg to differ. My African gray taught me to kiss a bird. I never did that. <laughs> that was like, oh, no, I'm not going to kiss a bird. And this bird spent its whole life in a cage. And the lady obviously kissed it through the bars, but she was afraid of it. And she would put it in a towel to clip its feathers, which I don't clip their feathers. And I would never put them in a towel. It just terrifies them. Anyway, there he is. He's scared of you. He doesn't want to be on you. He's on your shoulder, and he wants to kiss, and you're like, I don't know you, wait a minute, are you going to hurt me? <laughs> so after years and years of practice, he got me kissing parrots. So what's the first thing I do? I stick my big nose right in his baby's face, and baby goes, ah, I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> you're in my space. Who are you? You're brave, but stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she generally likes people, but, you know, they, she will bite, you know. She even bites us all the time. <laughs> Which, you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard habit to to break birds yeah, up. Yeah, but I had an advantage today because she doesn't know me, yeah. and she's in a strange place, so she's like in her best behavior. Yeah, and sometimes you know I, we have a another parrot that I think is doesn't bite me just because out of fear, you know, kind of just doesn't know what you know is a uh, bird was likely abused uh, in its early life and seems to have a fear of of males. Which isn't unusual for birds. You birds, you typically prefer females. I don't know why. But <laughs> now, is this bird uh, seven years old and has a lifespan of fifty to seventy. Yeah. yeah. Do they? Is it is it fully mature? Yeah. At what age yeah. are they fully mature? Um, um, well, uh, they reach uh, sexual maturity about six to eight, sometimes a little earlier. So she's she's fully mature. That way. So they, um, they they don't have a long like we have. No, and she was talking by, uh, you know, knew, knew several words. So, you know, by you know, got figured about six, eight months, she probably knew more words than a human would <laughs> at that time. You know, in her first birthday video, she already knew several words and could communicate with us. Uh, so, they, you know, they have a, a, a rapid early development. You know, so they don't know. Oh. So, BB has. Uh, Yeah. What what plans do you make for a, a bird? Um, well, right now, you know, she uh, there's you know she has three humans that we can pretty much work on. So, um, and we're all reasonably young. At some point, you know, there would have to be arrangements made. Um, but there's no shortage of. Uh, That's this place, the second um, website. Yeah, she has, she has she has lots of, uh, of fans, and there's lots of people that you know. That, you know, have birds and use birds. It would be the one that, you know, she could even, you know, I guess the, the research into African gray parrots is kind of winding down. The, the woman who did most of the, the research on uh, on Alex is uh, going to be retiring in the next several years, and, and they're not planning to continue that research afterwards, so, which I wouldn't want to see her go <laughs> into a situation like that, too. But, yeah, I mean, there's a, an excellent chance that, she could outlive me. <laughs> she has to be in your will, right? Yeah. Yeah, she, uh... I have a niece. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she likes birds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and that's one advantage of BB having so many fans and being, you know, uh, so well-known that there wouldn't be any problem placing her. But it is a serious problem. In yeah, general, this place, know. the Gabriel Foundation has 700 parrots and people constantly calling, trying, because they're they're kind of, well, they're like one of the best places as far as training people and adopting. 
tear us out. But yeah, it's people buy them on a whim. You know, they're like, oh wow, I'll just you know go out and get a bird. You know, it sounds neat. You know, and, you know, and that that's one of the, the disadvantages. I think probably should put something up on BB's website okay. trying to discourage people from because you always know, hey, you want you want people to see what is you know a bird is capable of doing. You know, to, to demonstrate their intelligence and make people aware that they're not just you know some mm -hmm. dumb animal, but then you run the situation of people watches. Oh well, I want a bird that does that. Well, you know, you can go out and buy an African gray, but it, you know the 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 to get that bird to a point where BB is now be able to communicate. You're you're talking literally a full time job for for multiple years. So it's uh it's not something that you know people but people they you know they. They don't see it that way though. They think it's going to be easy. You know, I just get a bird and I'll say a word a few times to it and it'll be fun and, you know. That's why sadly Craig was his world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's hundreds of, out, of Humane Society advertising birds. Yeah. I see. They've got hundreds. I think Petco hates to see me come in because I discourage the parents with small children who are trying to buy the budgies. I'm going, oh no, you don't have any idea hard they are to take care of. Well, even a little budgies, people underestimate how intelligent they are. They are. So I mean, pe people think, oh, well, it's, you know, $15 bird and they, and you know, five. And, five. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, people just don't really think much about it, but it, at one point, the world record for the most words uh, spoken by bird was held by a parakeet, like uh, 1,500 words, a little parakeet. And they have a little they squeaky voice and, and, you know, it's almost it's hard little, to understand what they're saying, you know. Voices go out here somewhere. You're but, like, yeah. <laughs> they can be trained, and you can tell when they when they speak, though, and you can hear them even the ones that are highly developed. You, you can tell there's a, you know clearly an intelligence there, but then you can also tell there's a, a big difference mm -hmm. between like a parakeet and, and an African gray. Um, but African mm -hmm. grays are at the, the high end. You know, probably only crows and ravens. Match African grays and intelligence. And African grays, the bird world. as far as birds go, they're more like cats in their sense of humor, <laughs> right, and, their, yeah. <laughs> and their their knowledge of, or they're just their sense of humor, really. Yeah. A little sarcastic, a little how far, how how much further? <laughs> what about this? Yeah. Well, she, she she you know she definitely seems to have a sense of humor and will play jokes like mm -hmm. you know she'll. You know, I'll go up and I'll like say, have her try to do something over and over again. Say this, say this, say this, and won't say it, won't say it. And then as soon as I walk away, then she'll say it. You know, and then she'll laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, or uh, you know, did almost kind of thing like a little Stewie on Family Guy, where she go, you know, Eric, you know, Eric, Eric, <laughs> yeah, Eric, yeah, and yeah. over going, and finally yeah, you say yeah. what? And say hello. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and it's amazing. It's a shame that she's, you know, so nervous when they right. talk. But you can, you know, go on uh, her website or just go to YouTube and type in BB and Parrot. Um, and she has, you know, hundreds of videos probably up by now. And uh, they have, you know, a total of over a million views on all of her videos and all the different websites. My bird used to sit behind this lady that sold insurance on the phone all day. And she had four different laughs. And one was, ah, ha, 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 ha. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they use all the different ones, whatever gets you. You know, they're they're fishing. Yeah, it's a. It truly is amazing that you know so much information can fit in such a, a small brain. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> brain. it's, it's not very big, but yeah, you know, it's a different operating system. Yeah, they're. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's also. Uh, Shows a little bit, of, you know, the potential that are there for, you know, because they, they're they're intelligent for an animal, but there are other animals that are that are differently, you know, mm -hmm. their intelligence might be different. Mm -hmm. um, theirs is more human-like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but like uh, birds are interesting. One of the interesting things they found is that they're one of the few animals that re it gets music, and understands, and can respond, um, follow a beat. Um, and, They've done two different researches have done uh, studies on it and uh, found that uh, parrots and elephants and maybe dolphins are the only animals besides humans and that even uh, primates, uh, the great apes don't. Senegal is it. always making up songs and if I <laughs> sing a song a few times through, he'll catch it and he'll start telling me what, what note is next. 
And then he'll change it a little. And then he'll do something else with it. He's dancing. Dancing. Yeah, dance. You dance? No. <laughs> She's not in the dancing mood. <laughs> She's just taking it all in. This is a little unusual for her. She's probably like, I don't know what to think about all this. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. She thinks uh, Kelly's her mother. So. <laughs> Can you do a duck? What's a duck say? Come on, what's a duck say? What's a duck say? Can you do a duck? Sometimes <laughs> turning away. Yeah. Some turn African greys uh, won't even talk with other people in the room, and there's owners that say they hear their bird talking all the time, but only when That's they're That's my bird. My bird won't talk when I'm there. He waits. I'm in the other room, talking on the phone. Then he's just like, ah, 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 on the phone himself. And he says, really? And again, the, 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 she's kind of, you know, they, they can get self-conscious. They don't want to make a mistake. And so, like, when I'm alone with her, she'll practice stuff that she's not familiar with, that she wants to, to learn better. Um, this is Talking in her Good night. Good night. Sometimes this makes her more talkative. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Good girl. It's a prisoner. Can we do another one? What's a duck say? Can you do a duck? What's the duck? <laughs> 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 that was so smart. Can you do an owl? What's the owl say? <laughs> How about a turkey? What's a turkey? <laughs> 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 It's like the trick booth or something. <laughs> <laughs> so far. And, and you well, know, you know, they're strange. You know, they got their their brains work differently. You know. And they know when you mean it. They know. Oh. Yeah. Whatever. What's this? Do you want that? What's this? Can you do that? What is it? Is it? You take a guess. What is that? You can identify probably about twenty different kinds of foods. And one of the first ones was bread, and we have a video up on YouTube of her, and you kind of see it click in her, in her face when she when she makes the correlation that this is what I asked her like an hour ago to identify, and I told her it was bread, and I came back, and you could see her pupils dilate. It's kind of like she's going, oh, that's what you showed me a little while ago. That's bread, and her pupils dilated and contracted, and she you got it nice. What's that? Did she get excited? Yeah. yeah, it was like excitement for that. She just like with us when we learn something new, we get the little neurons firing. And, uh -huh. uh, Richard Feynman used to call it the pleasure of finding things out, <laughs> and you could just see it in her face. And I was really glad to get that on video because uh, you know I've seen it before when she, when she, when her pupils dilate like that, but to actually uh, be able to replay it over and over again and say that's the moment right there. She yeah, that's bread. <laughs> Next year, we should have a DVD road trip video. <laughs> Maybe visiting her family or friends and events like this. So. Sounds excellent. Should be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming.
place where she wanted to step up and then she wanted to go back. Silly bird. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> <laughs>